2,000 liters. Wow, that's it? No, that's gotta be 20,000, sorry. 20,000, 20, yeah, okay. 20,000 liters. Okay. All right, we gotta, oh, there's Nancy. We gotta promote her to panelists there, Jim. Are we live? We are live. Hey, everyone. Everybody, welcome to our virtual tasting with Virginia Distilling. Uh, I'm just intervening because I get blamed for all technical difficulties, and we're having technical difficulties right now, so it's my fault. I'm Brett, by the way. <laughs> uh, Jim, behind the binnies, you might have to give Nancy video and audio privileges since she had to join as a attendee. Um, there we go. Hey. Okay. Hey. There we go. Hey. Welcome back, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As normal, as normal, we've gotten the outtakes away. So Pat, take it away. All right. Well, uh, we've got a few people trickling in here. Welcome back to another Whiskey Wednesday with Vinny's Beverage Depot. I'm Pat, along with Brett and Joe from the Whiskey Hotline. We've got guests, uh, returning guest Nancy Fraley, Master Blender Nancy Fraley with us this week, as well as Amanda Beckwith, who is the Director of Education. Is that the official title? Yes, experience, education, I, I get to wear some hats, yeah. <laughs> uh, the general does it aller at Virginia Distilling. And um, so why don't, Amanda, why don't you start us? We're here to talk about American made single malt today, kind of a uh, niche category, but a growing category. And we've got a couple of pretty impressive ones to taste. So uh, why don't you give us a little background on the distillery and uh, that beautiful distillery there behind you. Thanks so much for having me. It's always wonderful to talk with people who love whiskey as much as I do. Uh, Virginia Distiller Company has been around for a few years. We started to distill in 2015, and we've been all about American single malt since the get-go. So our founder, Dr. George Moore, was an Irishman. He had uh, a lot of uh, passion for collecting and drinking single malts, and so his dream was to have a really great American single malt. And uh, his son, Gareth Moore, is our CEO and kind of the brains behind our organization. And uh, so the vision was education being part of the American Single Malt Commission, raising this new category up. And uh, so I'm a huge lover of single malts, just having the barley really shine through in, in the whiskey. So we've been aging our whiskey since 2015, and Nancy's provided some amazing insights for us. I'm so grateful for her intelligence and thoughtfulness and just her, her heart for the whiskey. So it's been great to have that. <laughs> and yeah, we finally released Courage and Conviction this spring in April, and uh, our founder, Dr. George Moore, had the saying, have the courage of your convictions. So when it came time to name the whiskey, we knew mm. this is the one it's gonna be. Uh, our brand director, Marlene Steiner, said it's been staring us in the face all along, and in this crazy time that we're in, with so many people just with really good hearts needing time to, to spend time with their families, do something for themselves, it's been a, a whiskey that speaks to a lot of people. So that's kind of our, our initial story. All right, so American single malt, of course, we're using 100% malted barley. Uh, where are you guys sourcing most of this malted barley you're using now? Yes, we've experimented with growing a little bit here on site, and uh, there might be a future release that's all 100% Virginia barley, but the nitrogen levels in our soil are pretty high, and knowing we want this really great two-row spring barley, we've been sourcing from quite a few farms in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and uh, so they, they handle the barley for us. They get it malted in Minnesota and we bring it in and so that's that's where we've been sourcing most of our barley and this is a pretty big operation i asked you before we kind of started going live here what the capacity of that still is and yes. your wash still is two thousand liters which is ten thousand good liters. size ten thousand liters 10, yeah 2600 gallons um, so that is sizable i mean that's on par with many single malt distilleries in scotland so if uh to kind of but then the spirit still of course gets slower but if you kind of pare this down by the time the whiskey's aging um, do you have like a barrel amount you could give the audience here of how many barrels one round through the stills makes? Yes. Yeah. So it takes five to six days from the time we mill the barley, mash it, ferment it for three days, and then do the two double distillation, you know, copper pot stills. It takes time. After that, we have about six barrels full of we're using former bourbon barrels. So those are the 53 gallons. Um, if we do larger like sherry casks or other type of barrels, the cuvee wine cask, it's even less barrels than that. We, we double distill quite frequently so we can get 10 to 12 barrels per day with those runs. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's, it's really surprising to me how much goes into just five or six barrels. 
another cool thing uh, is the mill you're using, right? So yes. th that's pretty cool that you actually have, this is the most Scotch-like operation I think I've seen in America, as far as even just the look of it, but including this antique mill you're using. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, our Bobby mill, it's, it's beautiful. I wish I had a picture to show you right now. It's through the room in the back. It's red, fire engine red, really gorgeous, and it's a century old. So this was made in England for a brewery in Edinburgh, Scotland. And the cool thing about these types of mills, you guys have traveled in Scotland, you've seen your share of them, but they're pretty rare in the US because they were manufactured so well that the breweries and distilleries that use them wouldn't even need to replace a part, much less buy a new one. So it was more likely for them to go out of business than the, the mill to stop working. So they're, yeah. they're gorgeous. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, that's there were, Two that's the story right yeah, yeah that's the story and bobby went out of business because they made a mill for everybody and there was nobody else that needed a mill because the thing <laughs> never broke yeah they went out of business they declared bankruptcy i think in like 1967 so yeah yeah it's, it's really there popular. apparently is there apparently is a, a family that still do all the maintenance for all the distilleries and breweries left in scotland and england that have them and, and apparently these guys are like super super wealthy now and it's a father, was a grandfather, a father who's it's passed along. a Welsh along family, isn't it, I think? To his son, yeah. And they're literally the only family that still has all the parts and does all the maintenance on the Bobbies all throughout the distillation, the distillation business. And yeah. they're still running if people bought them. There, it would be interesting how much it costs to get that thing shipped over because those things also weigh a ton. They're cast yeah, iron. Yeah, cast iron probably, right? They're not small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I love how thoughtfully they're made that you can adjust the grind to whatever consistency you want. So for us, you know, 70% middles, 20% husk, 10% flour, you can just make it exactly what you want. And we replaced the belts when we got it. We painted it red and we were like, uh, what else do we need to do? It's set. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to have to touch it again for a generation probably. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so you're making this single malt. Uh, what kind of yeast are you using on this? Are you using something proprietary you've popped up or is yes. this a kind of commercial distiller's yeast? We use two different types of yeast and they're proprietary. One is the workhorse. It does the job of really converting everything over for us. The other one brings in some fermentation notes that I really love. Those esters really bring out, Nancy, you'll know, it's like uh, walking through and getting Sorry. candy pineapple, banana nut bread. It's just lovely. So we're, we're very attached to our yeast. <laughs> <laughs> so are you introducing so when you're doing when you're you're um inoculating when you're so you're doing one are you introducing the yeast at two different times or are they both going in at one time or are you letting because you said three days so you're 72 hour ferment right yes so do they all go in at the beginning or are you fermenting for a period of time because i know and for different reasons because of the temperature cavalon was actually he had i believe three different yeast strains they mm -hmm. used a Cavalon and they inoculated at three different times based on trying to control what was going on and how well or how vi how how vital the yeasts were depending upon the temperature. Yeah. So are you are these going in at one time or are these going in two separate times? We've been experimenting quite a bit and uh, we typically do pitch one before the other. Yes, we don't mix them in. And, and yeah, there's a reason just watching the temperature and what happens first. It's just for us, we really like flaring a little bit. So, yeah. Sorry, I'm answering a question here from Facebook. Uh, Glenn on Facebook asked us what a cool, refreshing summer cocktail using whiskey would be. I am, of course, suggesting uh, whiskey and ginger ale or maybe ginger beer if you're looking for something a little spicier. You're generally going to want to use a lighter, more fruit forward whiskey. This whiskey is, uh, you know, full bodied and all, but it does have, like you were mentioning to earlier, that that really high estuary kind of tropical fruit note character to it that would go pretty nice. And you can never discount the classic highball either, right? I mean, yes. a little club soda, some whiskey, and then if you want to get fancy with it, you can garnish it with, uh, you know, a little bit of fruit or an herb or something. But just malt whiskey with club soda in like a Japanese style highball is a awfully refreshing drink on a hot summer day. Yeah. A weird thing I do is I don't freeze. I actually, I don't use ice cubes in my highballs for the whiskey. I just put it in the freezer, the whiskey itself, for a very short time so it doesn't dilute. I love that. Yep. Yeah, that sounds so you're, a hot summer day. I like it that way, too. <laughs> it's so good. So, so, with start, so, with, so with courage and conviction, so let's, so you just, how old is the product? 
and what point in time, I guess, can you walk us through what you guys were thinking? What was the thought process? So you know you have this distillate in barrels. When do you start trying the product? And when do you decide at la how long you're going to wait before you're really, really ready to get something in the bottle that yes. is going to be commercially viable and this excellent? Our motto has been from the get-go, we'll let the whiskey tell us when it's ready. And having another product line, our American blended malt whiskey, you mentioned the port cast finish when we were first talking, that's really given us the freedom to do that to an extent. So we have a really geeky website called batch.info. And if you head there, you'll see we even have the ages for when the barrels entered, our yeah. cask houses when they, the barrels were dumped. And so everything in this bottle right here is just under four years old. And so for us, we knew, okay, we're going to start sampling even just a year in to see the climate in Virginia is crazy. Our, our series of mentors, one of them was Dr. Jim Swan, and he really taught us you change your distillate to match your environment. You don't try to manipulate your environment around the whiskey. So we knew we were working with a subtropical four season humid climate that was going to see some crazy weather. We were just talking about Scotland and it's always so consistent. I feel like it's always 45 degrees when I'm there. The, the joke is <laughs> January or July, you pack the same suitcase. It's probably going to rain. Right. So, you know, here our barrels have seen negative six degrees and 108 degrees. And we can see 60 degree variances within 24 hours. The beginning of May, we were having frost warnings and then hitting 90 degrees. So for those of you on Facebook, if you're watching um, hot weather barrel staves expand and soak up the spirit, cold weather, they contract and push it back out. If you're in Ireland, Scotland, this is a very seasonal thing, spring and summer, fall and winter. Uh, and that's how you get your color and your flavor and the complexity of the aromas. For our barrels, they're getting such a workout. This is happening multiple times in one day. And so being able to check on our whiskey, even just a few months into a year, we were seeing some noticeable changes and sending samples off. Our, our mentors were saying, you're sure this is one year? Because it smells and tastes like a six or eight or even 12 year old. And the heartbreaking side of that is the loss. I mean, the angel share in Scotland is one to 2% a year. We're seeing six, eight, twelve percent loss out of a single barrel in a year. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, that definitely impacts how long we want to wait. We don't want to say, "Oh, we have to wait twenty-five years before opening this barrel up." It could be bone dry. So, well, you know, even at a when um, uh, when when we were checking the cask at even a year old, uh, just just like Amanda said, I was amazed at at how, uh, you know, granted it was only one year whiskey, but but just how advanced it was to say, you know, a, um, an Irish or a uh, Scotch whiskey of the same age it was just incredible. I just the, the the difference was unbelievable. So I think that too kind of informed when it seemed to be ready, right, Amanda? That it's you no know, at at the age that it is right now, just a little under four years old that, uh, at least to my palate, it tastes a lot more advanced than mm -hmm. even six, seven, 10 year old, um, you know, whiskeys from, uh, from the you know, UK and Ireland that I've had. It's just uh, sure. amazing that environment, you know, what it does. Well, some, some, some of the early products that were introduced as you guys were building the facility and distilling whiskey and rapidly are actually blended Scotch whiskeys. What how were those barrels handed? A number of those were winning awards before Courage and Conviction started winning awards, um, starting with the port finish. And you've done a number of different barrel finishes. How were those barrels handled? What was their time in Scotland before shipping them over to the United States and working with them? Because I'm wondering if you had some of that local climate influencing what was happening in those barrels. It's true. So when we were getting started, instead of having a vodka, gin, a rum, we knew we loved barley, we loved whiskey. So what we did was we released an American blended malt. So instead of your typical blended whiskeys, famous grouse, doers, Johnny Walker that have 30 to 40 different whiskeys going into every bottle. And there's often grain whiskeys made in cotton stills with just one or two single malts put in. This is just a marriage of, of two single malts coming together. So we worked with a distillery in, in Scotland that had aged their whiskey in barrels for at least six years before shipping it over. So six, eight, 12 year old samples coming to us doing sensory and saying, yeah, we like this, go ahead and ship it to us. And then instead of just adding our own distillate that is aged at this point, two and a half, 
close to three years together as this marriage, we're moving it into a second type of barrel to finish. So it doesn't count towards an age statement, but spending about a year in a true port barrel from Portugal or local port style wine barrels from Virginia wineries really enabled the two whiskeys to integrate beautifully. And you get a lot of flavor and complexity and finesse. And I think that that's really uh, part of why we won so many awards. I know our port cast finished whiskey is one world whiskey awards best in category every year and we've entered it. Um, our cider cast finish is one of my favorites. Whiskey Advocate ranked it in the top 20 whiskeys of 2018. Great whiskey. Yeah. Lucky number 13. Yeah. 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 All right. We've got a few questions here. So uh, back to fermentation. Um, is the fermentation temperature controlled and do you change the temperature when you pitch that second strain of yeast? Very good question. We absolutely control the temperature. So you can make the yeast kind of go dormant by keeping it chilled and then you can kill it off by letting it go hot. So we don't want it to get too hot. The, the longer the fermentation time, the more we have room to play with developing flavors. So that's exactly right. Uh, we don't so much think about now we're pitching the yeast and adjusting the temperature so much as watching the time progress and keeping an eye on how the yeast is doing, become, becoming you know, more active or less active. And about how long does that fermentation take? 72 hours, so yeah, three days. Pretty standard for malt whiskey. Yes, yeah, we've experimented with a little longer, uh, but we really do like the 72 hour window. Well, you right. do seem and that is, yeah, that, that would be normal. What, so what, just for, just to follow up on that question too, what are you looking at? How do you think you would appreciably change if either A, you let it get hot and rushed it a little bit, or B, if you control the temperature in some way or change the yeast strain to extend your fermentation time to 96? You don't normally hear in Scotland, you hear a few that are at 96, a couple with Royal Lochnagar on their weekend to go over a hundred. But other than that, what, what, what do you think would change if you went longer, for instance? Well, we, you know, it's interesting. We really pitch our yeast around 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit to 86 Fahrenheit. That's the window that we've really liked from the get-go. If we let it go longer, I think that we would develop certain esters that we might not have seen as much of before, but I think those would still be dominated by oak over time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that it would be worth it. That's my uh, thought. You might be seeing some extra um, few soils in there too, and you know, maybe, you know, a, a little bit more acetaldehyde or something. I just, I'd some bubble gum notes is yeah. my thought. Right, because you could autolyze. I mean, you run the risk, the longer you go, the, you run a risk of autolyzing too, where it starts to heat itself. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, so speaking of more temperature control, do you climate control any of your barrel stock at all uh, versus non. That's from Keith and Bobby Comer. Oh, we love the Comers. <laughs> no, no climate control. We we have some really great warehouse practices. So what we do is we have sensors placed among the barrels and we're able to track things like humidity pockets and evaporation rates through that a little bit. But no, we have, I wish I had pictures to show you all, but up on the hill, we've got two large cask houses. They're metal clad. So as the sun's beating down and absorbing the the heat from the sun, you're definitely seeing uh, more evaporation from barrels that are higher up, obviously. It's just what you would expect. Are you they palletized the or are they racked in there? They're palletized in there. We had a dunnage style cask house when we were first getting started that really? we converted to a bottling house. And it was it was uh, really fun to play with the, the evaporation rates in there as well. So you're so. it's it's aging in more of an American whiskey style warehouse yeah, not now a brick house, with these but metal clad sides and it's gonna get a little more little more subjected to those temperature swings that are already pretty wild in Virginia. So I mean speaking of American aging, a big issue with American malt whiskey for a long time was that it had to see new charred wood at some point in its life in order to call it malt whiskey to in order to call it by its grain correct have you is any of this going into new wood still we experimented i think we have four maybe six barrels total that are new charred wood we really like the gentle interaction yeah. uh, of used barrels and it's great for us because you know kentucky and all the bourbon distilleries there and other states that are making bourbon they're forced to use new charred oak and so for us, we're very happy to, to give this barrels a second life. And roughly 50% of our whiskey aging is in former bourbon barrels. And so but it's all used Cooper's though. All used Cooper's. Yeah, yeah that's good. I mean, because new Cooper's just bludgeons, 
you know, malt. It's a more delicate, fruitier so grain aggressive. than something like corn. Yeah. Yeah. And very wonder, and aggressive. And I'm wondering, Pat, that question, maybe we asked that question about the American influence, if you had, because I think Nancy can address that. And that might have something to do with the wild temperature fluctuations, even though it's in used wood. Yeah, this, this may be a planted question, but it's from Mark Fraley. And he says, that, he says that there's a great single malt flavor, but there's something uniquely American about it and he can't quite place it. And what would you say is driving that American note in this decidedly malt forward whiskey? Um, I, we could both take a stab at this if uh, you want to, Amanda. I'm tempted to say that it, it um, has a lot to do with the, uh, the uh, warehouse itself. And, uh, you know, that as uh, uh, Amanda was saying, you get both seasonal variation in your uh, warehousing as well as diurnal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, of course, being palletized in a, um, in a metal clad, in a white sided uh, metal clad, uh, as opposed to black, I should add, you know, where you get more. Um, um, amplitude of the the barrels. So in this one, you know, the you just get that a uh, um, more um, I don't want to say aggressive, but more uh, uh, forceful ingress and egress out of the uh, cast. Now, I don't know what you think, Amanda, but but I and I, I don't know that I've tasted the the uh, the barrels in the new oak. I I don't know if I've had a chance to do that before in the you know, a virgin American cask. But I I think given your ester profile, that it would just be so overwhelming on the Swivsky. Mm -hmm. It would just railroad it. Um, and you know it's so beautiful and um, elegant. <laughs> it is, but it. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to take a stab at what kind of gives it its American um, profile? Yeah. Well, I think you and I have both talked about uh, what the hallmarks of a good whiskey are. And for me, it's always complexity. And complexity has to be achieved through being able to get different notes from different areas. So mm -hmm. you want the fermentation notes to come through, just like you want the malt to shine through a little bit. You don't want to taste a, a whiskey and go, I don't know what grain this is. That's, right. you know, that's important to us. So I think there's a way that you can say, all right, I know what I'm gonna do with these barrels and maybe blend them in as a component. And for people who really love oak and wanna go out and, and have this as, you know, a very tannic, fun expression, sure. I think there's a place for it on, on different palettes, but for, for me personally, delicate interactions really don't mask anything. And that's what I think. Yeah our American single malt is all about letting everything shine through. Yeah, you want a symphony, not a tuba solo. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a tuba solo, okay? That's an homage to our resident tuba player, Pat. <laughs> so it's been a while though. Uh, so on the, on the wood note, Crisp also asks if you're concerned about extracting too much from the wood in a short period of time. But I would think that, you know, a big mitigating factor to that is that used cooperage and then blending in the back end of taking barrels that are showing more wood and less, correct? Absolutely. So for just the bourbon barrels that are roughly 50% of what we use, I was just up there making selections for our future batches. And what was really fascinating is the look for, okay, yes, I'm looking for these aromas to come through. Yes, I'm looking for these notes to come through on the palate, but also thinking about the finish. How long are these notes gonna last? Yes, I want to find barrels that bring those in, but not too many because they might not have as much of the top notes that I really like. So it's that constant balance and saying, all right, marking these down, we kind of have a little interior grading system of 1A, 2A, uh, one, 1, 2, and 3, and then A, B, and C. And C is not a bad barrel. It's just a very foundational barrel that has a lot of the notes you'd okay. expect. And A might be more of the, wow, there's a lot of Honey Nut Cheerio coming through or something really that stands out as a single note. So finding enough of each one to really blend together something beautiful and nothing masks anything else. So if, America, if these American oak barrels are making up about 50% of the blend, what's the next biggest component wood-wise that we see in this beautiful Courage and Conviction malt? Well, it's a roughly 25-25% split for the other two types of barrels. One are sherry casks. We use Oloroso, Fino, and PX barrels from Spain. And then our secret sauce barrel are these Cuvée wine casks. And 
in the industry, they're known for being shaved, toasted, given a quick char, and then recreated. There's back that Jim Swan connection. Jim Swan, okay. Yes. The, SD, the SDRs, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Jim Swan, audience, was a, uh, a whiskey consultant for many years, unfortunately, now deceased, but worked with many distilleries all over the world making malt whiskey and was known for championing this STR cast, the shave toast rechar. So, taking wine casts, shaving the layer of char off of them toasting them and then recharring them, right? And that's what you're calling cuvee casks at Virginia. That's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, cuvee is just a, a way to denote the quality of what was in there before. And we love the alliteration. So yeah, SCR doesn't mean very much to the public, but that's exactly it. And yeah, having Jim Swan here on site was a lot of fun in our, our beginning months. And uh, yeah, we, we love the legacy that he left behind for us. SCR yeah. is the biggest thing out of that. Very cool. So what else we got question wise here? Uh, a question about the distillery actually, we can see this still house behind you. And a question I asked you before we went on here is the horizontal copper tubes audience are the line arms. Line so arms. as distillate is evaporating up the neck of the still, it then has to cross over the line arm and fall down a condenser, which is kind of directly behind Amanda right now. Yeah, behind uh, my chair. <laughs> there, there we go. go. Those vertical. Oh, there we go copper pipe shows are the condensers. So did you guys do any kind of experimentation with the angles on those line arms at all? And how did you arrive on this specific still shape? You know, because every distiller in Scotland won't shut up about how their specific still and their specific line arm angle, it's the same way they've done it, you know, since so and so and so and so and so and so before did. It's, yeah, we, we're really set with the way our, our swan neck and line arms go. We haven't experimented with that. Uh, the reason for just not having it angled too much, we, we know the temperature that we run our stills. We know the work that is going into the reflux and how much flavor is being developed in the stills before they're able to make their way over. And so for us, after timing it, knowing what our low ones look like, knowing what our heart run looks like, we just know this works really well for us. So I don't imagine changing it. Uh, you never know, but it's been working so beautifully. We've been but a horizontal really line arm is generally gonna make a pretty light and fruiter, more fruit forward style of malt whiskey, yeah. which you definitely see in the finished product right. here with this beautiful, you know, kind of pineapple tropical note. Uh, somebody mentioned banana bread earlier, I think. It's really gorgeous. Were and the stills are, and the stills are for scythe or were they manufactured here? They're for scythe, yeah. This is really just a Scottish distillery sitting in Virginia. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's like the best of both worlds. <laughs> we always okay, say but... we take old world sensibilities and traditions and, and put in some fun new world innovation and frees us up to do a lot of fun things. <laughs> so Nancy, when you were blending up courage and conviction here and helping them out, kind of create the vision of what this was going to be. Sure. Um, did you have thoughts ahead of time going into this, or is this a simple matter of you tasting this variety of barrels they have and coming up with something that married those flavor profiles? I mean, did you have any kind of end game and goal? Sure, well, you know, I, I think it was, and uh, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on anything, Amanda. You would say, we wanted to stick by the original inspiration of Dr. Jim Swan and you know to to do the basic you know 50 percent um ex bourbon 25 uh, you know via three sherry cask and 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 25 in the cuvee and um uh, where i came in on that was to kind of introduce um some blending techniques of thinking about more of a pyramid structure when you blend as a, uh, amanda alluded to a little while ago where you have yeah. uh, Certain casts that you know might might be what you know what we call A series or A, um, you know character B character C character and the the way that you use these to kind of build flavor, um, uh, in a, a essence you know that's I I think it was a combination of these two things really, um, and you know two two uh, philosophies that they're really actually quite meld beautifully to together and um uh you know where where one kind of gives the basic structure and then then what i brought with with my theories uh you know wants to kind of give a little bit more nuance or if you uh you know you you see a um a batch kind of going in a direction you don't want it to go then you know you can kind of go back to your pyramid structure and kind of you know rethink you know what you need to add to it um 
uh, something else that I, I, I don't know if it's too early to get into this or not. Um, and I'm going to talk about slow reduction, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Is that that in 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 part of that blending process? I know you guys have heard me talk a, a lot about um, slow reduction. So it's going very slowly over time from cast strength down to bottling strength. So with uh, uh, with courage and conviction, for instance, it, it was really a six month process. Wow. Where whereby um, you know it was re reduced very very slowly from you know the uh, wherever the, the barrels, uh, the um, entry proof being roughly 125, you know, and, and going down to 92 proof uh, over the course of six months. When you were doing so the slower reduction, were you doing it, I guess I think of it almost Armagnac style, were you dumping barrels, reducing a bit, and then going back into wood, like aerating, or were you just dumping and then slowly, slowly, slowly reducing in tanks? Okay. Okay, so reduced in the tank, not in the barrel. Yeah. Okay. Right. There is some natural reduction in certain barrels because of the humidity. So we do see some, just because of that breathing in and out, it's not just the whiskey escaping, it's sometimes some of the humidity coming into the barrels. And that's a really beautiful result. So, so you're losing alcohol in some barrels naturally. Are you, and I assume you're gaining in others then too, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a wild way to make malt whiskey. Right. Those uh, the uh, ones that that uh, you know that, that have been in those humidity pockets that have tended to reduce naturally, I think they're just beautiful. Those are always my personal favorites, uh, but because with that a little bit more humidity, they're just a little rounder on the palate, you know. And um, and you know, water, you know, let's face it, uh, it's natural, but it is an additive, right? So you don't have to go quite as far from uh, cast on the, to bottling the strength. Sure. Which is always, uh, <laughs> well, I think that, that slow reduction really shows in that you've kept this, you know, this big chewy body on a yes. whiskey that even though it's, you know, 92 proof by a lot of American kind of nerdier whiskey standards, it's kind of low. I mean, it's not at all though for scotch and it's, you know, and it's certainly plenty to give, to maintain that rich full mouthfeel. Um, but, you know, when people talk about, oh, a higher proof bourbon or something, you know, they're talking a hundred plus. And so for something to be 92 proof and maintain this kind of body and mouthfeel, I think is really impressive. Uh, back to one question about the casks. Uh, uh, Michael from Facebook asks how you retain the cask influence if you do the STR method. So Michael, I'm assuming you mean like the, what was in the cask previously and how were you train that, you know, wine essence if we shave, toast and rechart. Uh, I'm not that familiar with that. I mean, I suppose you would retain some Right, but I mean that whatever was in there before seeped deeper into the staves than you're actually saving and toasting. When you're shaving, uh, Amanda, like how much comes off? I mean, it's just a little layer, right? Exactly. It's almost a way of enlivening the wood. And so for us with those cuvee casks, we're seeing some bright red cherry, rich red raspberry, some beautiful milk chocolate notes coming through. So it does take time for the whiskey to make its way in and it's going deep enough into the red layer that it's hitting where the wine had previously gone. Cool. Well, there you go, Michael. Hopefully that answers that. So what's the end game here with courage and conviction now? I know that's the second time I've used end game. Um, but it, was, this, was this launched as a first release or is this something where we have this flavor profile now and, and now it, you take it from Nancy and the rest of you at the distillery to try to recreate this every batch? And is, uh, I assume we're gonna find it on, what's your batch notes website? What, you know, Batch.info, yes. Batch.info, um, that's, that's everybody here. Yeah, so batch number one we named after George G. Moore and uh, batch two will be named after Jim Swan. And so we are looking to achieve some consistency we're going to hold back a little bit from every batch so that it'll just kind of be working in there but there'll definitely be an evolution the really fun thing that we're looking at next spring is releasing line extensions so there'll be courage and conviction cuvee cask that is only aged in those barrels or mm -hmm. bourbon barrel or sherry cask so you'll get to know that and uh, i think it'll be great to have all four members of the courage and conviction and single malt family together very cool uh, is, is there plans to release older expressions in this long term or is this like, you know, a lot of Scotch distilleries, newer Scotch malt distilleries might release something at eight years old or 10 years old, but the whole time they're saying, oh, of course, we're going to wait till our, our actual product will be 12 years old. You guys have something like that in mind? 
Well, and I guess the, the extension is what is your window? Because it's the same struggle, probably not quite as extreme as Cavalon, but what is your window in which thing because of the climate and with it, you, that you're aging that just eventually, like you said, 25 year old barrels probably dry. Yeah, it's gonna, at some point it's gonna be too much. Yeah, I think that's part of my responsibility to make sure we, we don't let any of the barrels miss that window. And uh, the, the fun thing is, because we're not hung up on an age statement, we really are free to say, yes, the whiskey is ready, now we're gonna go ahead. There are some techniques where you can save the whiskey from going too far, so we're gonna just keep taking, taking little samples, making sure everything is going well, and if we need to stop a whiskey in its tracks before it's over oaked, we can do that. Future plans are, I'm just telling you secrets, but we're, we're looking at some distiller selects. So it would be very limited, maybe five or six barrels picked out to really showcase a specific style and even some single barrels that are cast strength to show off individual barrels that we, we call them honey barrels and they're just so good. And uh, there's one up there, it's a Tio Pepe Sherry that I have routinely hug. <laughs> and uh, Nancy, I need to get you a sample. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. The address well, to the Lincoln Park Binnies is readily available on binnies.com. Yes. If you want to fill a second sample bottle, that's all I'll say about that. You got it. So, <laughs> so, we're, so on casks. that, because Nancy, you said you were, you were talking about, you know, sort of having, gravitating or liking some of the barrels that you're, were obviously exposed to humidity. Are you guys starting to get some data, both physical data and sort of organoleptic data, about the differences between barrels closer to the ends, barrels sort of buried in the middle. If you're palletizing and then shoving a whole bunch of pallets together, there's obviously going to be different climatic influences on the outsides versus what's in the core. Um, so what, what, what are you learning about that now that, because I'm assuming you have to sort of pull things out, take some barrels and then push them back in. Are you doing that much movement with the barrels in the warehouse or? Yeah, so we have a cellar master, uh, Brian Hersey, he's fantastic, and he does all the heavy lifting, God bless him. And we definitely noticed that the barrel situated in direct line from the door, slightly to the right, were having the most warping, the most aging, uh, it was just the most evaporation, exactly what you'd expect. And I think it was the constant in and out, the, the climate impact was just exacerbated by that. And also towards the very back of the distillery, uh, cask houses too. And the interesting thing there is we have two large fans, one in each of our cask houses, and that kind of helps from having too much of a buildup of humidity. It also keeps the airflow that we need. And uh, I think that's also impacting certain barrels that are in that line of, of airflow. Yeah. No, not climate controlled, but you got a big poultry blower in there or something. And a little <laughs> bit more evaporative floss too, yeah. I would imagine, you know, right right where you get that airflow, you know, um, you know, so you don't have, uh, you know, whereas you get deeper into the, the stock and into the pallets, you get more of those ethanol water pockets that develop, um, you know, and, and not, not quite as much movement with the airflow. Um, so yeah, the, the ones that are a little closer to that fan have a little bit more evaporative loss as well. That's exactly you know, yeah. right. And we don't rotate our barrels. Where they're put, they stay unless we're moving them down to pull a sample and then putting it back up. And it's it's like whiskey Jenga. <laughs> Best game ever. <laughs> well, whiskey how Jenga much had a whole is, other meaning for me before that. <laughs> what is that? Well, so what is your what is your total capacity in that warehouse? How many once that thing is just like crammed full? How many barrels can you get in there? About sixty five hundred barrels. Okay. It depends on the type, but yes. So we'll be building a third warehouse before too long. Okay, cool. I figured because it's, if you're based on your fermentation time, you would have 68,000 liters a year. And that would be if you only had one fermenter, because that's a five day cycle. Obviously you're able to do more than that. Absolutely. So, so you can hit, so see, so theoretically you can, you're, you're, you can run a hundred, couple hundred thousand liters through. Right, which is puts you in the level of Edradour, mm -hmm. a little bit bigger than Edradour, a little bit bigger than Springbank. Yeah, for for this year, our goal is one hundred fifteen thousand proof gallons, which is eighty two thousand cases. Okay. So. Okay, so four hundred thousand liters. That's a decent. I net mean, puts you in the range of a, of a number of distilleries in Scotland. That's decent size. Yeah, and we do have the capacity to go bigger in future years. We're, we're still getting up and running. This 
you know, year one for Curves and Conviction, but I'm excited to see where we are in five years. Yeah, it looks like so there's... you had mentioned, go ahead, Joe. I said, it looks like there's some room in there to add stills. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that Built could be wrong. <laughs> So, I mean, outside of Courage and Conviction, obviously that's the new release, the cool new thing we want to talk about, utilizes your full kind of menu of casks available. Uh, you mentioned the cider cask earlier. The other one we have in front of us is the port cask, actually. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where those casks are coming from and what flavors people might be able to find in here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for the pork cask finish, again, this is a marriage. Our story is kind of there on our logo. We've got the split V, so we brought over a whiskey from a distillery in the old world, added our whiskey that had been aging here in Virginia. Yes, that is it. And then the, there are 10 little spikelets of barley in the middle of that V. Virginia is the 10th state, and for almost a year, sometimes longer, we finish in different styles of, of barrels. So uh, for this one, this was our first release that we did, and uh, the, the port barrels, yes, we use true port barrels from Portugal, but we're also surrounded by some amazing cideries, breweries, and wineries. So we thought, why not showcase Virginia with some local uh, Virginia port style barrels? So on the nose, there's just so much happening. It's um, really rich brown sugar. Of course, there's the soft vanilla notes. Uh, the backbone is beautiful. I have this lingering cinnamon on the finish. So this is one I, we had a gentleman ask about cocktails earlier. I use this one in what we're calling the Shenandoah peach. It's a whiskey sour and it just, it stands mm. out really beautifully. I love it in old fashions, black Manhattan, Sazeracs. So this is my neat sipping whiskey, curl up with a dog and a good book on a rainy day and sip this for hours and you'll be very happy. <laughs> um, Notably darker fruit note for sure. I mean, yes. it has that dark dried fruit that you expect from port, which is overall a darker, more brooding whiskey, I guess, if we're going to give it some personality. Yeah. Um, now this is, this is going back to the roots though, this is your own whiskeys blended with whiskeys made in Scotland, correct? Yep. All 100% malted barley. The youngest of the distillate we brought over from the distillery in Scotland is six years. And then the youngest that we're putting in is about three years for this one. Am I crazy or am I tasting some peat in this? So there, what we bring over from Scotland does have a very light little hint of it. It's nothing like an Isla. It's not no. going to be your log. It's <laughs> more of like a water source that flows through peat, sort of delicate. But it's no, some smoky complexity that I really love, so. Very cool. I don't think you really notice that peat so much until, or uh, for me, it doesn't usually pop out until I've had some courage and conviction Very and um, have this next, and I, it just really seems to pop out, which I love it personally. And I love both. Right. <laughs> I know they're like really good siblings. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So what, what other projects, so we know kind of where you're going, what other projects do you have? Because I think there's always this fight you, you, and, and some people messed it up by not being transparent about what they're doing in terms of sourcing. Some people were very open and said, hey, we're sourcing and this is really good. The people, and I think Virginia Distilling is, is should, uh, hopefully is in that position where you did a nice enough job with all the stuff and we're transparent enough about what you were blending from other sources. And obviously you've hit a home run with your first release with what you've done. What other things are you going to be able to play with in terms of continuing one? Are you going to continue to source whiskey from Scotland and continue that project? We hope so because the whiskeys are wonderful. Yeah. And what, uh, what other things are you sort of playing with in that space? I think transparency is huge. It, it goes into my love of education and whiskey is such a wonderful world. It touches on so much from history and culture. It's something that you can share and relate with people and really just stop and breathe in. So I want to make it more accessible and I think transparency is the first step. So we have that in mind from the moment we developed our logo right there. Two whiskeys coming together. We've got the description of whiskey from Scotland married with whiskey in Virginia. So that is always going to be important to us. I think it tells our story in a really beautiful way where we came from. So we don't have any plans to discontinue it. Uh, we, we really love both the port and the cider cast finish so much that our plans are just keeping it going. And uh, we're going to always have a little bit of flex, but roughly 50% from Scotland, 50% from us, and just keeping that story going. The more creative room for growth areas that we have are, are along the American single malt line. There's just so much room to grow there. And so I feel like we've almost perfected 
fingers crossed, the American blended malts that we have. And with Courage and Conviction, there's not only the, the line extensions that I mentioned earlier showcasing the different barrel types, but we've got a handful of really fun experimental barrels. And so uh, I mentioned Distiller Selects. We've got, I don't know if I should sell any secrets, but we have six Chardonnay barrels with our single malt aging in them. So we would have an American single malt aged in Chardonnay casks. And I sampled some two weeks ago and it was gorgeous. So I'm very excited about some projects like that. I think there's just a lot of really fun potential. And the Chard casks, you would have, would have remained, those would have just been toasted. With, with an Eric Very American delicate. oak or French oak, so just yeah. toasted American oak or toasted French oak. Now, that was another question I had is, mo are most of these wine casts you're using, uh, whether they were fortified or not, are most of these French oak or are some, or do these Virginia wineries use some American oak? So uh, a lot of, so we, we've stuck with only the Virginia wineries more for the finishing projects. Okay. So that there is a lot of American. In fact, what's fascinating to me is some of the barrels used for our port cask finish from local Virginia wineries that do a port style dessert wine. They started out as bourbon barrels. So wow. they used them. Yeah. Uh, King family, they, they got the barrels, I believe from Buffalo trace. And then, so it's, it's a really fun story. The cider barrels that we use, their first life was a Laird's making Laird's okay. Applejack. Most people don't know this because they think New Jersey, but actually the Laird's Distillery, they make their cider in North Garden, Virginia, which is 20 minutes away, maybe 15. If it was Gareth, our CEO driving, it'd be 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, they they have those barrels. So we thought this is distillery license number one. How amazing is this history? Yeah. So we use the barrels. We gave them to local cideries. They use them to age up cider in whiskey barrels we got them back and just have been trading back and forth now so that's been really fun so we do use some european oak but we really have some fun with american oak too very cool amanda sorry i i just have to ask um i don't know if we've talked about this before and i i hope i i'm not betraying any uh secrets here or anything Spill Are there it. plans to um to use uh, uh, your own distillate in the uh, in the cider cask. I, to me, that would be a marriage made in heaven. I mean, I'm, I could just give up and you know die <laughs> right then. I mean, uh, uh, just, that combination just sounds divine to me. There might very well be some cider aged American single malt that's 100% our distillate. I will keep you posted on that. <laughs> <laughs> Or Nancy, you can just do that. Just distract everybody. The next time you're there, if you're working with them, distract. Just say, "Look, helpless baby," and then run oh, up and just get yeah. up. Yeah, just roll a barrel into the back of the right. minivan or something. Right. <laughs> exactly. Don't don't give me ideas. <laughs> uh, we did get a question on Facebook regarding the sourcing, and that was, "Did you mention where you are sourcing from in Scotland? Which region and general age of Scotch?" Ah. I didn't mention the name of the distillery. It's a single distillery. Uh, I will tell you that we want to keep it proprietary. We don't want people hung up on that distillery versus our distillate. Uh, it's youngest barrels that what they do is they send us samples and we say thumbs up, we like this, and they ship it over to us. And then we add our own distillate and then finish it before bottling. The youngest that we get is six years uh, from there. It goes up age 12, you know, those increments, but that's, that's the youngest. So good question. All right, cool. Uh, well, we're uh, pretty much at our time limit here, I guess. So everybody, thanks for joining us today. It's cool to taste these couple of single malts with the people responsible for creating them. Uh, glad to be back in the saddle here for Whiskey Wednesday. We'll be back live again on Friday this week. Uh, who do we have on Friday? Uh, uh, Gareth from, uh, from uh, Glendalock. Oh, we have, oh, we have, we have Donald uh, O'Gallagher, co-founder of the Glendalock Distillery in Ireland. We're going to taste some Irish malts and pot stills and gins as well. So Amanda and Nancy, thank, thank you for joining us. Nancy, thank, nice to see you again. Thanks for joining again. A uh, lot of great info today. Anybody, if we didn't get to a question of yours or if you have any other questions, feel free to email spirits at binnies.com. That goes to myself, Brett, and Joe. One of us will answer your question if it's regarding anything Virginia. If we can't answer it, we'll ask one of these two uh, people here with us tonight. So again, thanks for joining and we will see you Friday. All right, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Nancy. Awesome. All right, thanks. Cheers. 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 Cheers.